I've had time to see what I make whenever there's no audience to show it to and it's like quite different um, and exciting and scary but I suppose like there's no point in making things if there's not a degree of risk but whenever you rely on some kind of stupid validation that's sort of meaningless in a way anyway. Hello and welcome to Art Goes On, a podcast featuring art people on how they keep the art world running. Here, they will share their vision of the present and a glimpse of the future. I'm your host, Pierre de Montesquieu, recording from Paris, France, so please, pardon my English. Before we start, as we try to make this show interactive, here's a quick reminder to follow our Instagram account, at AskArtGoesOn, where you'll be able to ask questions to upcoming guests. Now, on to today's show. This show was recorded on June 2020. Today it is my pleasure to talk to Claire Morgan, an artist born in Belfast and currently living in Newcastle. Claire is well known for her taxidermy sculptures, watercolors and paintings. Hi Claire and welcome. Hi. <laughs> so how art is going for you? Now it's going really good actually. It's been a really strange time because for literally years I've kind of I've increasingly felt like I desperately, desperately need to stop and be able to step back and think about what I'm doing and think about why I'm actually doing it as well. Um, and then there's always been something and I've never really been able to actually make that move you know, either because there was an exhibition opportunity and it seemed like, oh, I don't want to miss out on that. And then you've always got this kind of anxiety that if you turn down one thing, then you're going to kind of get left behind or, or yeah, whatever kind of irrational worries. Um, and then obviously everything did stop, but it was kind of different because it's this really, really awful situation and kind of yeah everything like resting on this sense of uneasiness and apprehension and that anxiety about you know what's going to happen or what might happen and so at the start of it kind of left me with really really bad anxiety and I've still not really gone outside the house for more than a few times in the past few months but um gradually it's kind of it's very strange saying that something good's come out of it because it's such an awful situation and so many people I've had a much worse time than meet you know people that are isolating on their own or people who have lost loved ones and but yeah I suppose that's kind of become part of it too that kind of sense of trying to to see hope in things or to find hope in things um and so gradually I kind of reached a point where I was able to start making things and I've started making lots of quite different things and kind of find time to try things that I'd wanted to try for ages but not been able to so I've been playing with painting and ceramic and drawing with different materials and drawing things that are very different from from what I usually draw um yeah I guess it's kind of really it, it really kind of brought to the fore how much I rely on my external validation and how unhealthy that is and so suddenly there's no audience and I kind of have, have had time to to come to terms with that and to see what I make whenever there's no audience to show it to and it's like quite different um and exciting and scary but I suppose like there's no point in making things if there's not a degree of risk but whenever you're rely on some kind of stupid validation that's sort of meaningless in a way anyway then it becomes more difficult to to take those risks so it's yeah it's been eventually been really good in that way that's funny because i remember you telling me that you had two different residences experiences one where they told you all the time that your work wasn't good and another one when they always told you that it was good And you said to me that's how you understood that you had to rely on yourself rather than on an audience. There is that, yeah. 
that's interesting actually so the last time i saw you i did tell you about yeah not not listening to other people you know that wasn't residencies actually i think if i remember i had been talking to you about my experience at art college and and the kind of the particular style of teaching of that there was in Newcastle and then relative to the exchange that I did in the Netherlands. And yeah, that was 20 years ago. <laughs> so that was before I really had any exposure or that much of an audience. And also before um, social media and all that kind of stuff, which obviously has had a massive, massive impact on how everyone kind of positions themselves in relation to to other humans i think we kind of increasingly live in a world where it's difficult not to get swept up in all that stuff of like immediate gratification of one form or another whether it's kind of validation or social media or buying stuff or you know getting what you want in whatever kind of context whenever you want it which kind of i don't know like in our superficial way of navigating the world that that kind of immediate gratification is what we think is going to make us happy, but it's actually precisely the thing that's going to make us unhappy. So it's quite useful to kind of get out of the habit of, of, of relying on that sort of stuff. That's funny though. Your work takes a lot of time to make. It's very meticulous. And you always lack time for family and friends, and even yourself. As you were just saying that you were questioning that lifestyle, what came out? Of that reflection? I don't know if I've been really looking for answers as such to anything. I think quite a lot of the time we're surrounded by so much noise we don't know what questions they are that we want to even ask ourselves never mind trying to find answers for them so I'm enjoying the process of kind of discovering the questions of what it what it is that actually worries me or uh, um, excites me or means something to me at this point in time and because whenever I have been working in a particular way for a really long time now, it's quite easy to fall back to those things that you that you have been doing for a long time and to not kind of question what it is that you're doing. Um, and yeah, I've been very much trying to question that and doing things that aren't meticulous or precise in any sort of a way. So what have you been experimenting? For a long time, I've been wanting to try more painting. I mean, I've, I've done painting a lot, but in a particular way. Um, and quite often it has been underpinned by drawing and just been a kind of elaboration of my drawing process or else it's involved using the bodies of, of animals or almost using them in a place of a brush, just using the bodies to make marks on a page or using dry pigments in place of paint or using paint as more of a drawing tool. But I've really got like actual real canvases and actual paint and nothing else and just been playing with that with no kind of um, precisely planned thing beforehand and, and, and trying to do it in a much freer and more intuitive way than, than I had been with previous things. And also playing with things like um, landscapes and figuration and things that are really, really different. But it's very early on, so I'll see if that goes anywhere or where it goes. And then with regard to sculpture, yeah, I've been really interested in clay. I mean, I used clay whenever I was at art college in 2000. And I think that's the last time I used it. And I really loved working with it. And for some reason, I just kind of, it, it didn't fit with whatever I, I was doing then. And then I kind of forgot about it. So I've been enjoying playing with that and kind of exploring ways of introducing other things to my practice, not just taxidermy and, and, and the things that I have been working with. You are working with different materials. A lot of them like watercolor or clay are quite unpredictable because they're unstable, so it dictates the way you work. It's a bit far-fetched, but does it make you look at the current situation that is unstable in a different way? Or do you find resources in your work practice to apprehend it? I think that the current situation has kind of heightened everyone's awareness of the 
the tendency of things to change. And that is something that I've always been kind of focused on, but it's been a long time since there has been an event that made me really, really connect with that in terms of lived experience. And so, yeah, it has made me feel like I really, yeah, I kind of, I suppose it's, yeah, there's there's always been a, a kind of to and fro between control and un, unpredictability, a kind of tension between those two things in my work. And that's probably a direct representation of what goes on inside my head where there's part of me that just wants to absolutely control every tiny little bit of everything so that I know what's going to happen and it's not scary. Um, but then obviously if you succeed in that then you take the life out of everything as well Um, and then on the other hand there's a part of me that knows that everything is going to change and we're only here for a certain amount of time and because of that you know while that's scary that's also the thing that makes things beautiful and meaningful and makes your your life worth kind of not that it makes your life worth living but yeah in a way um yeah it's an important thing isn't it the fact that things that things are transient and so you kind of should take the opportunities that you have when you were younger you were very committed politically and a feminist too you were born in belfast and witnessed the war between catholics and protestants you were making artwork to shock or repel people because you were angry and wanted to raise attention then you realized that maybe beauty was more efficient for that purpose. Today is a tough time with a lot of people revolted and especially artists. Could you please explain your process or how it evolved regarding that matter? So yeah, whenever I whenever I started, it's when I was at art college actually. I was making stuff that was very, very confrontational and yeah, that did stem directly from political concerns. But I don't know if I would describe it as political work, work that's made with the express intention of conveying a political point. Um, but at the same time, I think that there's a really, really important place for work that does do that. And I think if that's what you want to do, then trying to make aspects of it more palatable or pretty in some way is probably not the the right way to go but I think that, that my own concerns came from my experiences of death and of abuse and things at a very early age and I wanted to look at those things but I knew that those things are the things that people absolutely don't want to deal with but I wanted to engage with them on some kind of level so by introducing an element of beauty or poetry into the work then you can kind of access a softer part of people where they might be more open to considering what it is that you're presenting. I suppose it's just finding that balance between those two things and and where where that kind of yeah, where that's going to kind of bring about the most impact without you compromising. I don't feel that I kind of introduce things like beauty into my work in order to dilute it. It was, it was just the way that it happened. Have you been able to share views with other artists or did anything surprise you from what you've observed? Um, I haven't been doing a great deal of communicating with other artists and, and things like that. Um, but I've been watching quite a lot of TV, actually. Um, aside from, I've been mostly working, but when I haven't been working, I've been watching TV a bit. And there was a really nice show that Grayson Perry made during lockdown, specifically for that purpose. Um, and it was, it just ended last week, actually. It's nice because it's, It's an art show, but it's also a TV program, so it's a kind of lowest form of culture. He was inviting normal people to submit artwork to be considered for an exhibition that will happen some point in the future, and then talking to different celebrities and artists and people during the show as well. But it was just like 
really, really surprisingly emotive and optimistic and lovely to see all the the works of art of just normal people who have been sitting and they didn't have anything else to do, so they tried it for the first time. And it was just like really nice and touching. It was actually him, Grayson Perry and Philippa Perry, his wife, um, both of them making work. It was kind of both just as him, but actually it was both of them. And it was really nice to also see their relationship and their being in confinement as well and that's like literally my only interaction with other art during this time is on tv (laughs) your work is a lot about time suspension and an invitation to step back and look at what is going on during the lockdown we were all forced to do that in a way do you think that there will be a before after situation i think this this moment is an opportunity for for things to change and for people to slow down and for you know things like economy slowing down for example is something that's desperately needed and consumption and and all of these things which make the world healthier um as to whether or not that will actually happen i think that humans are very greedy and they have very short memories and my instinct is that probably things will go back to almost exactly the same way as they were before but i really hope that they don't do you still go on the roads to find dead animals for your taxidermy sculptures i haven't gone out to look for any dead animals on roads for a very very long time um i mean i'm sure if i did i would still find just as much if not more rubbish I've got quite a lot of things in my freezer that I need to make things out of. And so, yeah, I think my way of working is just changing quite a lot, actually. And I haven't um, I haven't felt an urgency to go out and find dead animals as much as I might have done in the past, which is interesting. <laughs> Probably quite a healthy change. <laughs> It's already been the case for a few years, but was it an opportunity to make your work evolve even more? I I think that I'd already reached a point where I felt like I wanted to make some changes in my practice. Um, And you'll kind of see that my work did slow down and I did start to play with different forms and different ways of making things. But it's been something that I've been thinking about for quite a while. I think that the past few months has been an opportunity to really kind of clarify what are the questions that I want to ask and what what changes do I want to play with Um, I'm still very much interested in animals and and I can't really see that changing but it's not so much that I want to change my practice but the idea of expanding my practice very much appeals to me just gives me more options in a way I think yeah it's like an accelerator exactly yeah moving on to the last part of the show I'm going to start by a question from the audience Nicholas loves your work and knows a lot about it and the range of mediums you are using. He asked, which practice do you prefer between drawing, making sculptures, installations or painting? Oh, um, that's a really difficult question. I think that I do lots of things working. I think that I work in lots of different media because each one of them brings something different. So. Um, drawing is very very important to me Um, I kind of it's like a way of thinking I suppose or processing my thoughts and I think whenever I'm not able to draw then I just get stuck and whenever I find myself stuck in some way if I start to draw then it opens me up again and so I couldn't really manage without that so I guess that's probably the most important thing but then A drawing in itself has got so many different techniques. It's at the moment I'm working with charcoal, actually, which I've not used for years. And it's lovely. It's really, really nice. I think probably the last time I used charcoal was whenever I was at art college, maybe, which is ridiculous. I mean, I've used graphite and pigment and pastels and things more recently in the past couple of years, and I very, very much enjoyed it. And then, you know, my sculpture is very laborious and time consuming and precise and it it seems like a bit exhausting and the thought of installing things is like oh god but then actually whenever I do it 
I really, really enjoy it and kind of having control over all the little different bits of things going on at one time and seeing it all come together is really, really exciting. And that's obviously something that that can only happen in the in the in the process of assembling the sculpture. So yeah, I just like it all. <laughs> But then, you know, the thing that I enjoy the most about it sometimes is whenever whenever I've had the idea for a sculpture in my head and there's a preparatory drawing and then I make it and it has the same feeling as the preparatory drawing does, then that's the, the thing that really excites me. And last question, what is the artwork that for you reflects the time we are living? I think I'm going to say... I went down to London before before the apocalypse started and managed to get to the Tate Modern to see the Turbine Hall Commission of Kara Walker. And it's this big massive fountain that's based on the fountain that's outside Buckingham Palace. And it's uh, you know, it has to do with the the British Empire and the transatlantic slave trade and the way that the kind of violence of different histories are intertwined and how those histories kind of seep into the present as well. Now, obviously, given all the recent events around the, the death of George George Floyd and things, um, it's um yeah, it's even more pertinent than it has been. And yeah, I just find it to be an incredibly powerful thing and I love the way that It's got this really, really super long title that's just like, it's just razor sharp. So uh, the title is, it's, it's with an overabundance of good cheer and great enthusiasm that we present the citizens of the world, our captors, saviors and intimate family, a gift and talisman towards the reconciliation of our respective motherlands, Afrique and Albion, witness the Fons Americanus, the daughter of waters, an allegorical wonder, Behold the swirling dramas of merciless seas, roots and rivers upon which our dark fortunes were traded and on whose frothy shores lay prostrate captains, slave and starfish alike. Come one and all to marvel and contemplate the monumental misrememberings of colonial exploits young. Gasp plaintively, sigh mournfully, gaze knowingly and regard the immaterial void of the abyss, etc., etc., in a delightful family-friendly setting. So... I think that's quite pertinent at the moment. <laughs> I think it seems like obviously all the events that have happened recently are really, really horrendous, but it does seem like there is a sense of optimism that maybe things actually will change and people actually will, you know, not just in terms of policies or whatever, but in terms of people's minds and what their beliefs are in relation to other people. Let's hope for the best. Claire, Thank you so much for being with us and sharing your thoughts so genuinely. I hope to see you in Paris for your next exhibition in 2021. I hope I'm in Paris before then, but goodness knows. Yeah, thank you very much. It's a pleasure and uh, hopefully see you soon. Bye, Claire. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of Art Goes On. If you like what you heard, feel free to follow and share the show on Apple, Google Podcast, Spotify, or on YouTube. Leave a rating or review to help people find the show. Thanks again.